Welcome to Lesson 9, and you may have looked up in the sky and seen all the stars and the constellations and wondered where the stars come from, um, how do they form. And um, if we look out with our telescopes and do careful studies, we'll find that there are two or three stars every year um, being created within the Milky Way galaxy alone. So we want to talk in this lesson about how the stars are formed and how they go from being a collection of dust particles and gas to being a main sequence star. So let me know if you have any questions and I hope you enjoy the lecture. In this lesson we want to look at the birth of a star, how stars are formed. And if you were to be an alien flying over the world and you wanted to understand the human lifespan, you would be able to observe humans everywhere from the moment of birth to the moment of death and all stages in between. Even though you might not be able to observe one human um, through an entire lifespan, from looking at the multitude of humans, you could understand what a human life was like. It's the same when we look at the sky and we see stars, and we see stars that are just coming into existence, stars that are finishing their lifespan, stars that are in different stages of the main sequence. And by that multitude of stars, you're able to understand and stellar evolution. So if I look at my own sun, I know my own sun is burning 600 billion kilograms of hydrogen every second, and then it's going to have a lifetime of about 10 billion years. And I can judge this from looking at the other stars in the sky. So how do these stars work? We've already talked a little bit about hydrostatic equilibrium in the stars, and I know that every part of a life cycle of a star is a balance between gravitational pressure crushing a star inward and the radiation and thermal pressure um, supporting that gravitational crushing. So here sometimes one star, one of these will overcome the other. I might get gravitational pressure overcoming radiation pressure or vice versa. So when I do this I get different types of stars. Um, when the pressure gets the upper hand, typically later in a star's life, that star will expand and it will get more luminous. And these give me the giant and supergiant stars, and they can be thousands of times their previous size. Sometimes gravity wins over the pressure, and it crushes the star, making it less luminous. And this is the fate of the white dwarfs and several of the smaller objects we see in the sky. So the idea of pressure and gravity forming a balance is also what happens in a stellar dust cloud. So when I look into space, I find a lot of gas. Um, it's about 70% hydrogen, 28% helium, and 2% of elements that are heavier than helium that have been formed in the stars previously. Um, sometimes this interstellar medium um, collects together and it forms clouds. And sometimes within these clouds, some of the heavier elements will form dust particles. And so I will get regions of space which are very, well, they're dense, um, about one thousandth the density of our own atmosphere, but compared to the space overall, very dense. One of these regions is the Orion Nebula. And if you're familiar with the constellation of Orion, and you look at his sword hanging off of his belt, and you look at the middle of the sword, you'll see that the star in the middle is kind of blurry compared to the stars around it. Actually, what you're seeing there is the Orion Nebula. And it's one of the only nebula you can see with your naked eye. You don't need a binoculars or telescopes to see that. So get out your stellarium and figure out when you can find Orion in the sky and make a point of going out and observing Orion's nebula. So I have other types of nebulosity. I have dark nebula and a dark nebula is where a cloud is very cold and dense and um, it scatters light, doesn't let shine, light shine through it. Um, around the edges we might see some reddening where the infrared light is let pass through. The longer wavelengths, the lighter let pass through where the dust is less dense and it shows some reddening around the outside edge. I also have reflection nebula which are very good at reflecting light of short wavelengths and that makes them appear blue like a blue haze and these are made of fine grains of dust. So stars are formed within this interstellar medium and since I have to be able to compact a lot of material together in a small space um, without creating too much thermal pressure, they're formed in dark nebula. So the 
disks of a galaxy, if I look at space in general, most of the gas is contained within the disk of a galaxy. So therefore, most of the stars that are being formed are being formed within these galactic disks. In these dark nebula, I have the crush of gravity pulling all this material together. And as it starts to condense, it increases the thermal energy. So the gravitational potential energy is being converted into thermal energy. And fortunately, um, the dust molecules can absorb this thermal energy and then radiate infrared photons, which carry the energy out of the cloud. In this way, I can compress the cloud without creating too much thermal energy that would stop the gravitational pressure from increasing. So once I am able to compress the cloud enough that it has enough thermal energy in it that it starts to stop radiating out a lot of its energy and it starts to shine, at that point I have what we call a protostar or sometimes called a pre-main sequence star. So here then, um, a typical dark nebula may contain around 100 solar masses of material, and it may be very large. It might stretch over 10 parsecs. And some of the densest regions in the cloud will contract under their own gravitational attraction. This results in clumping within this very large cloud of dust, and each one of these clumps may go on to become a main sequence star. So that's why you see so many stars clustered together in their formation, and you don't see very many lone stars created on their own. I can look at these protostars on a HR diagram and see that there are several stages that the protostar will go through. Um, the first stage, which you can see here as a constant temperature um, drop in luminosity, that is the formation of the protostar. And here's where the protostar is being formed um, from a gas um, that is the dark nebula. Then I go through a convective contraction and that would be this sharp drop down where the star is reducing its radius and it's using convection to carry the energy from the center of the, the dense cloud of dust to the surface. And here, a lot of the electrons are able to stay bound to the atoms until they reach to a temperature of about 3,000 degrees. And at that temperature, um, the electrons are removed and light is free to flow. So the surface temperature remains around 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And this happens through this entire stage of the star while it's contracting. The next stage is the interior of the star becomes dense enough and hot enough that the electrons are freed from the atoms in the center of the protostar. And at this point, it is, remains at about the same luminosity, but the energy is carried radiatively to the surface, which causes it to increase its temperature. So here I get a constant temperature with a decrease in luminosity. I then get a constant luminosity almost with an increase in temperature. I then reach the last stage where I fall down onto the main sequence and I become a main sequence star. So some of the details in the birth process is that as a star, as a star shrinks, it will decrease in its luminosity. So the smaller the radius, the less area I have to emit light, so the luminosity decreases. As the protostar contracts, its internal temperature increases, and this causes the interior to ionize and the surface starts to receive more radiation, which increases its temperature and luminosity. Eventually, the internal temperature increases to reach a hydrostatic equilibrium or a balance between the outward radiation and thermal pressures and the crush of gravity. That's when the star becomes a main sequence. So what depends on how the star ends up? What is its luminosity? Well, remember the luminosity is related to the fourth power of the temperature and also to the square of the radius. So for a protostar of the size of our sun, the outer layers remain cool and opaque, much like our own photosphere. Energy from the core and that point travels outwardly by convection, and the surface temperature remains nearly constant. What happens with more massive protostars, stars that are much larger than our sun? Well, if I get a protostar that's approximately four solar masses, contraction and heating occur very rapidly. So hydrogen burning is going to occur much more rapidly than is 
the smaller star, say the size of our sun. The more massive star means it has more pressure and therefore they have convective cores. So most of the energy is carried um, to the surface by convection. Medium-sized stars like our sun have radiative cores with convective surfaces and small stars are all convective so they carry all of their energy to the surface by convection. So as the protostar is forming into a main sequence it can add mass so there is a lot of material around the star and that material rains down onto the star. Um, many stars will form a disk due to the angular momentum and that dust will rain down onto the star increasing its mass. But at the same time the star is producing a solar wind much like our sun and this solar wind um, pushes the gas away from the star and some of these stars can um, eject up to a solar mass during the course of their formation. Looking back at our HR diagram, um, we can see that the lower mass stars um, may take a much longer time to develop than the higher mass stars. Um, for instance, a one and a half solar mass star takes about 10 million years to form, whereas a five solar mass star will form in about a million years. In the next part of the lesson, we will look into more detail on how um, protostars become main sequence stars and some of the things that happens to the region surrounding them. So stay tuned for the next part of the lesson.